Hello, everybody. Welcome. This is a continuation of our videos of the artists of Land River, our exhibit, which is now going on until May 15th. Today, it's my honor to welcome John Sabra, and we are going to join him in this interview and process. I had just asked him the question uh, about combining activism with your art practice, and he's going to give me a, a very good answer. Uh, I use the word how to be authentic with it, and he gives us lots of ways to continue our artist practice and our own way of communicating with others on this subject. So John Sabra is a professor at Ohio University in Athens, Ohio. He is an artist, an activist, a communicator, an environmentalist, and a professor. So please welcome me and we'll join this interview in process. Thank you. For those two things to come together, it was a very, very long, half a lifetime sort of slow evolution. And it was more about trying several different voices out for myself in activism for sustainability in the environment that eventually led to it naturally coming into the work itself. You know, mm -hmm. I don't, authentic is a dangerous word there, Val. And I don't want to like, mm -hmm. you know, because authentic is very, I think, um, individual and idiosyncratic. Yes, and, yes. and, you know, we are full people who evolve and, and learn through life experiences as I did. And so I, I cannot proscribe for artists how to negotiate, right? Like mm -hmm. art making and activism, uh, the two may be the same thing or they may never overlap. And sure. if your art making isn't activist, that doesn't mean that the artist in you can't be activist in other ways that don't necessarily seep into your practice. So. I mean, we are, you know, we, we see the world differently. We perceive the world differently. We have this kind of imagination about spatial relationships, right? Whether you're making sculptures or ceramics or paintings or whatever. And that spatial inventiveness and imagination, that translates to almost, in my experience, that translates to almost any situation where you're looking at larger issues or problems. So, you know, if you're if you're making large murals that are activist in nature and, and bringing a voice to a neighborhood and to a cause, mm -hmm. awesome. If you're, you know, doing if you're working with you know sustainable materials or out in nature doing something fantastic. But if you're not and you don't know how that's coming in your practice yet, then I would suggest that you go and apply your art brain and your art psyche to city council meetings when they're discussing things like oh um, you know carbon taxes or water you know conservation. Anytime those things are out there, very often we artists don't feel like we're, we're the right people to speak up about that. But I'm here to tell you that my experience has that we are needed in those situations. So my answer, it's a short answer, but my answer is that maybe they're not the same, maybe they become the same, but if your activism isn't a part of your practice, it's still a part of you as an artist. So don't be afraid to go out there and put it out there. Oh, I, that answer is great. For those of you just joining, I was asking John about how artists combine activism with their with their visual aesthetic, or as you just explained, there are many, many ways you can participate without, without going completely out of your art style. Just show up, just show up and let your mind heard at civic meetings, that sort of thing. Yeah. That's excellent, excellent. Good answer, good answer, I like that. Thank you so much. John Sabra, yay. Now, I know a bit about you <laughs> from my husband, Armin, another artist, and you two worked together in an arts materials facility in Chicago. And he said, you are basically the man to sell art supplies and know lots about them. Now, I like to help young artists create their I'm going to use the word journey like you did, the journey. And tell us about working and what that led for you as an artist later. Huh. Uh, <laughs> um, that's, that's like a seven a hour conversation, as you know, Val, you know. Um, yeah. Well, I, I mean, I think that, okay, so the thing I think I should be a little, give you a little bit of background, which is that, you know, growing up, I didn't know any, I didn't know art existed, you know, until I was like in, in basically high school. I had no idea there was art was such a thing. And I thought that all artists were dead. I thought they were just the people we looked at in books. I didn't know there were actual artists making art. I'm not joking either. I didn't know. I never met an artist. I didn't know there were artist people, uh, you know, small town mil military kid kind of didn't have any background or any global perspective whatsoever. And 
So I went to school at Pratt Institute right out of high school and having never been to a big city for illustration, because I, I knew you could illustrate things and I wanted to do, you know, Led Zeppelin's album cover um, so that they would get back together again. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and it was, you know, it was, it was eye opening and, and I went there for a two year associate's degree in illustration. That's all I could afford, um, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, but when I graduated, the, the summer after I graduated, I also, I actually uh, wrote and illustrated a dummy for a children's book and I submitted that to a company and then they called me the next day and they gave me a contract so I didn't have to work for the three months after school and I did this children's book which was, you know, hilarious and, you know, like all children's books, I guess it has a lot of nudity and violence in it so my editor had a lot of work to do. To, a little you know, bit of work, a little bit of it. <laughs> You know, had to get it down from an N17 to more like, you know, a 17 months, you know, but and then they didn't like any of my manuscripts after that because they were all like it was crazy stuff. Um, and then from there, I had to suddenly get work. And so I actually answered an ad in the Village Voice for someone who was a sketcher. And so I I and they said, well, come into the office. And I came in the office and they put a purse in front of me and a piece of Xerox paper and a blue ballpoint pen. And they said, draw the purse. And I was like, OK. And I drew the purse. Oh, the purse. Yep. And they came back and they go, you're hired. Next thing I know, I'm on a plane to like, you know, Taipei and Hong Kong and Dominican Republic, going to these factories, designing ladies' handbags. I had no experience in it. Didn't know anything. I'm working on Fifth Avenue. I know. I know. Um, so crazy. That didn't last long. I mean, you know, I, I designed, I was, they asked for, for um, Armani. They asked me to design this, all these little accessory bags. And one of them was a cigarette case. And um, no one caught that it was a coffin. I had designed a coffin. Oh, um, subliminal. Yeah. So I, I lost, uh, <laughs> so I lost my job there. Um, <laughs> Talk about um, and then I, I did, I was worked at an auction house. So about this time I had these crazy roommates in Brooklyn and one of them got a job at the Andy Warhol factory. Andy was still alive at this time. Uh -huh. And that's when I got to see that, oh, this whole big city is full of artists doing art things. And I was trying to be a freelance illustrator and a children's book author. And I didn't want to do, I didn't want to design ladies handbags. Just, <laughs> and, um, you know, I wasn't good at any of it because every time I got an illustration job, I thought my ideas were much better, you know, mm -hmm. not, just, not that they were, but the editors were, they were like, well, what are you doing? You know, we're not going to pay you for this crap. Get out of here. So, yes. you know, that was a long journey for me to go like, okay, I should probably just try to be one of these artist guys you know, mm -hmm. because that's all I like doing. And, you know, now I know you can do your own thing and all that stuff. So like anybody else coming to that conclusion, you know, I bought a car for 500 bucks and I lived out of it in the American West for uh, 40 days and 40 nights, figuring out who I was going to be, you know? Oh, um, yeah. And then I figured out I had to get a bachelor's degree mm -hmm. in art to go mm -hmm. to the next level. So I went and got a bachelor's degree. And while I was getting that bachelor's degree, um, which was interesting, switching from illustration to fine arts and all that, uh -huh. um, an art history professor who, who I love, she allowed me into a graduate seminar on Rembrandt. And they were going to examine the new, stu the new technological uh, studies of Rembrandt paintings to determine what was Rembrandt and what was not. Okay. I got into that so deep in terms of like the pigments they used and all, the, all that stuff, it was crazy. And it was after that that I moved to Chicago and I met your boy Armin. Mm -hmm. And um, I got this job at Goods of Evanston, Hawken yeah. Art Supplies. And I happened to know a lot of it because, mm -hmm. you know, I had this great seminar. And then when all the people come in, like Robert Gamble would come in sure. and I'd pick his brains and he'd be like, blah, 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 whatever. Yeah. And so after that, I was so fascinated with it um, that when I went to my master's degree at Northwestern University, I, I taught a seminar there in that. Um, all kinds of things. It was it was awesome. It's yeah. crazy. I, that Robert Gamblin connection. And you even worked a bit with Golden, I believe, on some of the pigments as well. Oh, sure. I have a little container of some uh, reclaimed uh, work there. Oh, um, um, Art Wera, Wera Paints in New York helped me out a lot. It's been it's been great. And that, that well, just gave me this framework to have a conversation about it with these people, you know? Oh, yes, absolutely. They really, they really want to talk about that stuff, as you know. They love yeah. that. That paint geek stuff I love. <laughs> I am a paint geek, so, it's true. Oh, yes. Oh, it's just wonderful. Now, leading into that, all of this pigments and this and that, and we have some work in the gallery right now of paintings with your acid mine drainage pigments yeah. in there. Uh, and you had a partnership with Guy uh, Reifler, a civil engineer professor at OU. Kickstarter project, come up with all this. 
Tell me about that experience. The the Kickstarter project page is, is a piece of art right there, I think. That video that we play in here is wonderful. Thank you, thank yeah, you. It's great. Well, there's a long backstory that I won't get into, but I had arrived at a sort of a crisis in life when I got my first full-time teaching job at Washington University in St. Louis. And it was, it was because I had been very activist and I had been writing letters and it was about the Iraq war and, and you know, Bush Jr. wants to go in again and all this stuff. And um, I, I wrote another kind of letter to the editor in the St. Louis Dispatch and I got boxes of hate mail one day at my home address, boxes and boxes of hate mail. And all I had said was that we should work with the United Nations, we should figure out where we were. And like, um, and I just thought, and it just kind of set me back and I realized that I wasn't, you know, wasn't impacting change, right? Mm -hmm. And so after that, that's when I began to look at what, what can I have a voice in? How can I be active and do something that's going to create change? And at the time, my daughter was a little tiny baby, and so, you know, you start thinking about the future of yes. your kids. And I'm like, I'm like, what am I, you know, what am I leaving her? And that's when I really started looking at, um, you know, issues of sustainability and environmentalism. Because mm -hmm. that's a part of my upbringing. So I got after Washington University, I got a full time job here at Ohio University. Mm -hmm. And I was going to come here for three years. And I've been here 17 years. So um, <laughs> And I didn't know anything about this place. And so some really great, awesome faculty members here in the environmental um, studies program, Michelle Maroney, Nancy Manring, Lorraine McCosker, all these people, oh, they put together this group of faculty people to take us out into the woods, into the hills. Those of us, especially who are not Ohioans. Yeah, um, I'm Ohioan, so they're beautiful hills. They're, yeah. good, they're good hills. Great and, hills. and they were like, here's these trees, here's these invasive species, here's this thing. And then one of the things was, here's this acid my drainage, right? And I was like, wow, this is, this is terrible. You can smell it, you know, it's awful. You can see it, you know, it's, it's awful. And so, you know, being the pigment geek, you know, I took some in a jar because I knew it was iron oxide, this pollution from coal mines that had been abandoned. Mm -hmm. And I played with it in the studio and I couldn't get much traction with it. It wasn't, it wasn't very nice to play with, you know? Uh, yeah, no, no. Oh, uh, no, it was, you know, it was funky. I mean, you know. <laughs> Say, what's he work? Yeah, he's like, what's, what is he working on now? There it is. It just looks like this. It maybe, doesn't look know. too nice right there. <laughs> no. So um, I, I just, I was like, well, you know, I hope I can paint with it. This could be something, this could be a valuable resource of something on. And, and just honestly, it was literally like a short while later that I was, you know, uh, watching my daughter play soccer. And this, and this woman comes up to me, one of the mothers, mm -hmm. Elaine Getz, who at the time was getting her PhD with uh, Dr. Riefler. Okay. And she's like, hey, we need an artist's help. And I was like, no, okay. So I went and had coffee with him and he's right. like, you know, I got to make, I got to make quality pigments out of this iron from the acid mine drainers. I was like, the stuff in the creeks. So I got a <laughs> jar of that back in my thing, whatever. And he's like, so we started working together. That was 10 years ago, 10 oh, years ago. It's and amazing. we didn't get much traction, like because our pigments were terrible. I mean, they were terrible. And so we'd try to get traction, try to get funding and everything else. And we just mm -hmm. couldn't get it. Mm -hmm. um, eventually working together along with our students and grad students, we got to a place where the pigment was delicious. And we were like, this is pretty good stuff, you know? Uh -huh. And so um, that's when I just literally, um, daughter again, I wanted to show her the American West that I knew from my living out there in my car. And so, although I, I did stay in a hotel with her. And so we actually, um, we drove down through Portland, Oregon. And I was like, well, I know, I know gambling's in Portland, yeah. Oregon. And so I was like, why don't you guys go to the science museum? I'm gonna go down the road here to this factory. Okay. And I just went in, I barged in and I was like, hey. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, you guys, look what I got. And so they were scared naturally, but eventually I convinced them I wasn't, you know, a danger to anyone but myself. And so Scott Jalotli, who was production manager at the time, came out, met with me. We, we spent almost three hours together that day and they were like, yeah, we'll help you out. So they took our pigments into their labs. They checked whether it was non-toxic and light fast and other kinds of stuff. They talked about our grind and other colors that would work better. And so somehow I convinced them to actually make a giant batch of this stuff. And that's where the Kickstarter came from. And yeah. once we did the Kickstarter, they, they made this and the tubes were like, um, <laughs> I love your space. Like, this was the, um, so this was the first tube oh, they yeah. made. Reclaim Earth Violet. Yep. Yeah. And that was their idea for the name, which I was like, that was better than my name. I can tell you that right now. And so we, we gave this away as a Kickstarter like reward, right? Mm -hmm. yes. And that was to help build this first pilot plant at the second worst seep of acid mine drainage pollution in Ohio. 
And the thing is, is that it was exhausting. I got to tell you, kicks, if anybody wants to know about Kickstarter campaigns, let's have a conversation before you jump into it. It's exhausting. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. we had 488 backers. We raised $33,000. We got the plant built. We built an art wall. We had some shows and other stuff. Mm-hmm. But what that did, that Kickstarter campaign and Gamblin's support of us, what that did is that let the Ohio Department of Natural Resources and other people go, okay, now we think it could be viable right Mm -hmm. and so that is when everything took off just a few years ago this is 2018 if i remember correctly oh my gosh yeah yeah that long ago crazy and then we got um and then with since ohio department of natural resources came in and said yeah we think this could work now they helped us go after federal money so last year we got 3.5 million from the federal government so now we're building a full-scale treatment plant that can treat over a million gallons a day of pollution and make five thousand pounds to 6,000 pounds of sustainably sourced iron oxide pigment every day, every single day for like the next 600 years. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Crazy. It is crazy. Congratulations. That is, that is so monumental. Okay. And, you know, and that, that pigment can be used across, uh, I'm just a wild artist thinking paint is all paint, even house paint, everything's all pigment based. So can it be used for other materials besides fine art materials? Oh yeah, yeah. In fact, to be honest with you, the like the the you know this because of your you know your boy Armin, but basically <laughs> like artists don't buy enough pigments to really support a pigment industry. It it needs to be a much larger industry, mm-hmm. and so for us, the primary industry is going to be concrete colorant, construction colorant, ceramics oh. colorant, brick colorant. Yeah, and it's very inexpensive. We import almost two hundred, uh, almost two hundred million tons from China every year of iron oxide pigment for those purposes. So we'd love to supply a fraction of that from this, you know, sustainable source. And then when we sell it, that will pay for the plant. It will create jobs. In fact, it'll double the tax base for the zip code, and then it'll also um, allow us to have a profit that we're, we're set up the company so that the profit doesn't come to us. The profit goes to clean up further streams that are affected by acid mine drainage. That, that is mind boggling right there. You know, yeah. to think that it's being used in all of those different products. Yeah. So. They use, uh, yeah. use it in cosmetics, they use it in food, oh everything. Oh my gosh, that's wonderful. Great, great. Oh, I'm so glad to hear more about that. And now back to the artists again. Yeah. So because you've been there and done that, I'm thinking of five, four to five bullet points that we artists can just take away as mantras practically, you know, as we're thinking about the environment, as we're thinking about activism, you know, little sound bites that we can grab onto. (laughs) Um, Yeah, I got some sound bites. We should keep this PG-13 though. Oh, okay, there we go. Um, So here's something I'm running into a lot lately that I think is is something I'm I'm telling myself a lot, which is um, as you're trying to make a more sustainable life and practice, right? Um, Don't stress about being perfect. This is something that gets me a lot. You know, um, it's whatever you're doing, as long as you're working towards it and you're researching and you're you're doing whatever you can, when you can, Mm -hmm. don't beat yourself about up about not being perfect. None of us are gonna be perfect. If you want to be perfectly sustainable, go die in a field and let them let all the animals eat you. That's sustainable. That's sustainable. I'm not everything else is a compromise. Everything else is figuring out a way for us to exist and coexist. And there's gonna be take. Mm. You know, that's it. Yes. Um, you know, that is a good one. So don't worry about perfectionism. Don't worry about perfection. Do some. Yes. Yeah. Love that. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I try to tell myself that all the time because I, you know, when I go give talks, people come in and they're like, you know, well, you're not doing this, and what about this, and what about that? I'm like, yeah, all those things are true. You know, I can't, I can't be perfect. You know, right. The other thing I'll tell you is that this is also this goes hand in hand with one. This is two, okay? Okay. This is offset your carbon footprint. Okay. It's a minor thing. Go on, just literally go into your Google search or whatever, okay. and go carbon offset. You do that and there's a lot of companies and you can just go in and they'll help you on their websites, figure out kind of what your carbon footprint is. Mm -hmm. And then you pay a fee to buy some carbon credit sort of things, right? To Mm -hmm. make your practice carbon neutral. You offset the carbon that you're producing. Okay. Interesting. I do it every year. It's very inexpensive. Like it's no more than 20 to $30 a year for me to offset all of the carbon produced for my practice and my home life. It's very easy. Oh my gosh, that is... 
and, and, and I travel a lot. So, okay. So you're okay. So you're picking companies then is that, if I got this right, it gives you a list of companies to choose from that are, that have a lower carbon footprint. Is that so how? Partially very close. Um, okay. You go on like carbonfund.org is a, is a well-regulated one. I've worked with them for a very long time. Okay. And basically you go on and it'll, it'll, it'll um, give you a choice of how much you want to offset depending on your carbon production. And it gives you a calculator for that as well, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then what it does as a company is this company will then put that money towards say reforesting an area or renewable energy or something that is like carbon negative, you know, that is gonna extract mm -hmm. carbon from the atmosphere, mm -hmm. you know? And that's why it's car, that's why it offsets your carbon production. Gotcha. It's absolutely flawed. It really is. But the more that we do it, the more that we set up an industry for it, and the more that this practice becomes something really widespread and therefore makes more useful a carbon tax, which I know is flawed as well. But again, don't stress about being perfect. Right. You know? Ties with that. Good. Yay. Anything else? Um, obvious. Well, okay. So the, obviously, I should say this um, buy from sustainably, you know, mm -hmm. product plug. <laughs> um, product plug. Yeah, these are, I think there's still some sets left. We sold those out. Those are a lot, beautiful colors. I love left. those colors. You can just hit up your local supplier. Yes. Buy sustain. There are many, there are more and more companies every day that are making sustain more sustainable, more eco-friendly mm -hmm. artist supplies. Mm -hmm. So when you can, when it makes sense for your practice and what you're making, go for those, you know? Mm -hmm. Um and then also, you know, buy local if you can, go from your local store. Don't have it mm -hmm. shipped if you can go to your local store if you have one. I don't have one, but yeah, well, we and don't then, really. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but, you know, whatever. yeah. The other thing is this, is that um, like, let the companies know how you feel, send them a letter or send them an email, tweet at them and be like, Hey, look, you know, I like your products, but you got to come clean. You got to make the cyber carbon neutral. You need to make it like, you know, economically sustainable. Um, the more that us artists tell the companies to do it, they'll do it period. Yes. They'll do it. You can see that happening now. Many of them are changing things, you know? Oh, yes. You're absolutely right. They, they really take the artist's uh, viewpoint seriously, the arts material industry, and they do listen to us. They so do. that's a good point. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Uh, something else I do, um, it's not perfect again, but it's something I do. I use acrylic paint sometimes. Mm -hmm. And uh, so like the pieces in your show, that, that high texture is an acrylic yes. base. Yes. And so when I wash out my acrylic brushes, brushes with acrylic paints in them, or I have leftover acrylic paint, I put it all into a five gallon bucket mm -hmm. and I don't wash it down the sink. And mm -hmm. I let it just evaporate and eventually it becomes this giant chunk of acrylic. And then I call on my city hazardous waste and I, and I ask them how to dispose of it or to come get it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I also sometimes carve it as like, because it's pretty fun to carve into weird shapes. Oh yeah. Oh, I'm not making any good art, but it's fun. <laughs> Um, That's great advice. Ties right into this whole uh, virtual experience today of how to dispose of materials. And yeah. I can just picture this chunk of acrylic just peeling out of that five gallon paint can. That's got to be satisfying. a good feeling when that plops out of there. It's satisfying. It's amazing. Yeah. I'm like, wow. yeah. yeah. <laughs> I can believe it. Yeah. Oh, well, John, this has just been great. Do you have any, yeah. uh, did I miss anything? I know we could talk. We, we oh, mentioned it earlier. We could talk for two hours straight. We could. <laughs> I think I just want to also, like, I think that oftentimes I want to piggyback or circle back rather to my initial comments about, you know, getting out there and using your art brain and your art imagination in, in civic areas and other areas. Yes. And I, I think that we can no longer be uh, afraid of pressuring uh, not only our politicians, but our neighbors, our friends, our family. Right now, sustainability, environment, they're all a part of climate justice. And climate mm -hmm. justice involves systemic racism, deep inequalities, and these things are endemic to the problem at hand. We cannot have sustainability if we have inequality. Mm -hmm. And Definitely. if we don't have justice for everyone equally, we cannot have sustainability. So let's all make sure that our voices are active, right? Mm -hmm. For climate justice. I mean, I take it personally when those making decisions or polluting things undermine my daughter's future. And I refuse to say silence. So, you know, right. And this is because remember that climate stability is 
climate justice and stability is not some impossible sci-fi solution. Mm -hmm. We have all the tools and technology right now to solve it. No excuses, hold everyone accountable, but support everyone trying, you know? Oh, we're I like that. Yes. And, in, and that's, that's so timely in conversations as a, as a listener to that sort of, uh, let's say preaching, we shouldn't, we should listen. We shouldn't get taken aback. Oh, I don't, I'm not part of that. Or I don't have anything to do with that. Just yeah. take some time, listen and take away the good part, you know, yeah. just hear it. So, yeah. There's a lot of young, young voices out there that are doing it differently. And yes. um, I admire them and I follow them and they're not doing it perfectly and neither am I. And I'm going to support them anyway, you yeah, know, and let's, let's all do it. Support. Yeah, I agree. Well, thank you so much again. And John Sabra's down there at Ohio University in Athens, just teaching the young and teaching the artists. Go for it <laughs> and do all this great work. Ruining young minds, yes. Yes, wish you all the best. So thanks. Thanks for thank having you. me. I appreciate oh, it. Oh, yeah. Look forward to seeing you soon. Okay. <laughs> bye, Val. Bye bye. <laughs>